I should have. There we go. <laughs> oh, everybody continue with the wisdom that you were speaking of. Right? <laughs> yeah, if you join. Smart. Yeah, we'll if you say all the smart things all over again. Yeah, say all the smart things you were saying all over. Yeah. Um, anyway, it's so good to see everybody. We missed you, right? Well, we've been separated for a couple of weeks. So uh, thank you all so much for uh, being understanding with that. We actually had a great uh, a, a great time of gathering last week at our church. My son-in-law spoke for five different services. <laughs> and uh, you can actually go to uh, uh, his church's website and hear the messages that he, that he gave. Uh, they're, they're really good. And it's pretty rare for me to say something's really good like that. You know, I mean, not because I don't want to say something's really good, but it's just hard to find anything really good you know? And so anyway, we did all that last week. And um, so uh, just, just a little housekeeping, might as well do it up front. Uh, we will finish Mark next week. Okay. And then we'll take uh, a few weeks off and we'll resume. Uh, and we're going to start with Job on uh, Monday evening, January the 17th. Uh, none of y'all will care about this, but uh, the previous class, everybody cared about it. <clears throat> uh, I always say the same thing. That would be the week after Alabama beats Georgia in the national championship game. You know? <laughs> you know? Every time I've ever said that, it's turned out to be true. And so uh, anyway, uh, I have just learned through the years that the holidays go now from Halloween to the national championship in college football. I mean, and, you know, I fought it. I fought it for years and years. You know, we'd start these classes the first week – and I realize why am I kicking against the goads? <laughs> you know, just do that. And then let me tell you, Job, it's going to be fun. Uh, we talked about this, I think, <laughs> last time. Job's 42 chapters, eight lessons. I got news for you. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> um, I know we're going to spend at least two weeks per chapter. And I'm hoping to have this before we start, to let you sort of know. It wouldn't surprise me if we spent three weeks on some of this stuff. We're not here to work a lesson. We're here to learn from the Lord. We're not here to work a plan. And just the things that I'm learning and the stuff I'm seeing, we all think we know what Job is about. And, uh, and that's true. And there's an element of it, but there's a far greater thing that's going on with Job right here. And I think we might know part of this, but as we continue to get to discover and learn things, um, I, I just want to have time. And so um, it, it'll take us a while to get through it, but that's all right, isn't it? And, yes. uh, and just what I've learned so far and just getting ready for it, um, it's led me to a preliminary understanding of what we might do next. Okay. So I don't, uh, you know, I haven't locked myself into this, but I will tell you, if I continue thinking and feeling the way I'm feeling right now with what I'm seeing in Job and what we're going to be learning, we'll probably go and do uh, the first two parts of Genesis, the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And it's been like 20 years since I've taught that. I've done it three or four times. And the precept stuff will be useful to, to have a common experience with it. But there again, I suspect we'll take more time and probably even bring in some other resources. Uh, I did that the last time I did the precept stuff. And so who knows? We may... You know, honestly, that might take us to this time next year, <laughs> those three things right there. So, but anyway, we'll, we'll find out as we go along. But um, so anyway, it's good to see everybody. Uh, let me pray for us and we're going to dive right in. I love what y'all were saying before. So, Father, I thank you for uh, your word. Lord, we thank you for you. And we give you praise for you, your love for us, your compassion, your mercy for us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your written word. We thank you for your spirit. Lord, I thank you for your body, uh, which exhorts one another. And iron sharpens iron and speaks truth to one another. Lord, I thank you especially uh, for this group of ladies right here, Lord, and for how they just so uh, speak so much truth into my life. And I just praise you for that. Uh, Lord, we do lift up to you, Rachel. You know what's going on with the Lord? She's got that shingles thing. So, Father... By the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we speak your healing upon her and within her body by the blood of Jesus. Every one of those irritated nerve cells, Lord, every one of those, uh, uh, however we think we know how that understands and how that functions, that virus being raised up 
time because of challenging times. All of that, Lord, in complete total submission to the authority of the blood of Jesus, your healing upon her to where there would be no pain. Lord, not only no pain, but that she'll be able to declare, hey, it's the hand of the Lord that has touched me right here. Father, set her free. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So uh, y'all, y'all were already saying some things about Mark and I, and I do really want you to say what you did while I go, because I think these things were great. So Sabrina, you were saying, uh, what did you say while I go before we turned on the recording? Do you remember? Oh, it was about the, the woman who had anointed him. Yes. Anointed who? And they said um, in the whole world, what this woman has done will be spoken of in memory of her. And then immediately we go into Judas and it's these two people in the whole world, both of these things are spoken of, both of these stories, the woman who anointed him and the man who betrayed him mm-hmm. side by side. Yeah. It's really an interesting, because one of the questions was uh, contrast or actions with those of Judas and what do you see? Um, I, I said both actions will be known forever. Yeah, yeah. And her action was an action of what? Love. Yeah. yeah. What kind of love? Her- Mercy, kindness, um, a sacrificial love. Sacrificial, uh, extravagant. I love the word extravagant in that situation uh, because she poured forth, according to Mark, she poured forth uh, this perfume, this oil upon his head. Again, folks, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to make sure you go read all the Gospels to get the full account of everything, okay? Uh, Particularly tonight, we can't chase that a lot, you know, but it is so important. I think it's Luke that says that she anointed his feet and used her hair, you know, mm-hmm. to, uh, 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 to spread the oil upon his feet and his leg. I mean, it's just like, wow. Uh, you see extravagant love. You see some intimacy right here. Mark says that uh, it was a woman. Luke tells us who it is. Who is it? Mary Magdalene. Mary. Yes, yeah, Mary. It's Mary of the uh, Lazarus, right? And Martha. And they're in the home of who? Simon the leper, Simon, who used to be the leper. So does that mean that, that Simon is actually their dad? Some people think that. And I thought, well, that's sort of interesting. You know, could have been, but yeah, uh, you see this uh, comparison, this thing between extravagant love and extravagant what with Judas? Greed. Greed. Why why do you say greed? That's rather rude. (laughs) sold him rather true well he sold him yeah he sold jesus what did he sell him for by the way one of the other guy how much 30 30 pieces of silver Uh, you see that anywhere else in the scripture obviously you do i wouldn't ask right right where (laughs) somewhere hey i claim peter somewhere in the scripture back (laughs) in the old testament you see it as the price of a slave how appropriate is that? Yeah. So, but I, you said something there while I go, Sabrina, which I think is really, really important. You have this account of uh, the woman. And what was the response of the disciples to this? Well, they were, they were pretty outraged because of the cost of the perfume and it could be sold. But really, Judas, if I, in one of the Gospels, it says somewhere, it says yeah. that Judas was outraged because he wanted to put he would have sold it, put the money into the treasury and then uh, stolen it. Yeah. He pilfered from that. Yeah. Yeah. So the disciples that really spoke up and complained was, was Judas. Luke tells us it by name, it was Judas. And then it tells us the motivation because he kept the money and he wanted to get a hold of the money. So he's sitting there mouthing off about this kind of stuff. And the disciples were saying, Oh, this could have been used to feed the poor or help the children, you know, all that kind of stuff. And what was Jesus's response to that? Said the poor you will have with you always. Woo, that's that's rather crass. Is that the wrong word for that? Or what do you think, Sabrina? You're a wordsmith. Rachel, uh, you're a wordsmith. <laughs> it was very direct. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. The poor you always have among you, but you don't always have me. Is that a little myopic, a little self-centered on Jesus's part? Well, no, no. He's just stating the direct fact 
that you're not going to have me. And then he tells them what this thing of extravagant love, because it was basically a 10 month salary thing, you know, which tells you what about that family? Rich. They were rich. They were wealthy. Uh, you know, Mary, the one we think is Mary Magdalene, you know, she was saved out of some stuff. She has a demonic thing. Uh, did she have a kind of lifestyle that she might have made some serious money doing some evil things? Maybe. And guess what? She lays it all at his feet and over his head, you know? But then Jesus says, no, 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 no. She did this to do what? To anoint him for burial. To anoint him before. Yeah, before his burial to anoint. Did she know that? I don't think so. But this she did when he said it. Because he'd been telling them all along, I'm about to die. I'm about to die. It's at that point in time that you see immediately Judas goes and decides to go to the priest. That was the straw that broke the camel's back in Judas's mind. The oh, yes, I wrote that next, next door. Last straw for the money man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, there's a lot written about Judas and his motivation. We don't know. I think there is some things to be, uh, I think there is an, a modicum of truth, maybe, that Judas was trying to force Jesus's hand. All the disciples were wanting Jesus to be what? Savior of the world, king, man, we're going to be here. He's going to be ruling and reigning. We're going to be here. We're, they're all expecting it when? Now. They're talking about it on the way to Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, when you read the Gospels on the last meal they had together, they get in the fight over who's the greatest among them again. <laughs> you know? mm. So they're doing this thing. And Judas saw this going down. And there's a school of thought that says that, uh, here comes Lorraine. It uh, says that, uh, that Judas was innocent and that he was just trying to push Jesus along the way he wanted to go. Well, even if that's true, it blew up in his face. You know, that, mm -hmm. that was wrong. And I mean, he knew it. And that's when he comes back, you know, he throws the money at him later. He knew, but uh, he was grievous over what he'd done, but he had not truly repented over. Hey, Lorraine, it's good to see you. Okay. And um, so anyway, I just found it interesting that it was at that point in time that that's when Judas moved forth. Now, when was all this taking place? We, we saw it at the first of the... Uh, a chapter in 14th chapter of mark what's the time frame here passover yeah you got passover coming along uh first part of mark says now is passover and unleavened bread we're two days away <clears throat> and y'all know me I always launch on that passover and unleavened bread i'm not going to get into that tonight uh, i am going to put some stuff up for y'all on the the facebook page which is uh i mean i can actually bore you with it right now uh there it is can y'all see that <clears throat> Uh, memorize that and you'll do well. Um, and, and this is all saying the same thing. These are all just sort of timelines of everything the scripture says about the last week that Jesus was here on earth. And so it's useful. Uh, there will be no test on that or anything. So Sabrina's happy about that. She's had enough tests in her life to. That's one of the greatest things we get done with school is just no more regurgitation like this, right? You know, not having to get up every day and write a 10 page paper because somebody wanted a 10 page paper. You know? So um, anyway, yes, yeah, it's, it's a right around, it's two days before the Passover and the religious rulers were wanting to do what? What do they want to do to Jesus? Um, yeah, they're, they're wanting to arrest him. They want to get rid of him. Why don't they? Because Here. it's um, Passover. It's Passover. Well, they don't care about that, do they? They're scared of the riot of the people. There you go. They're scared of the people. Uh, is religious leadership scared of the people today? Doubt it. <laughs> what? I said doubt it. I don't know. They are. You They're, they terrif are. They're terrified. They're driven by it. Even the ones that are the good ones that don't want to be driven by it are often driven by it. And it's the saddest thing. I mean, it's just like, uh, uh, it's just sad. Uh, you cannot be afraid of the people. If you're afraid of the people and do what the people will do, what have you made the people? God. 
Mm. Exactly. And that's idolatry. Yeah. Mm. So you have the whole account we just talked about with Judas right there. You get down to where we uh, like the 12th verse of Mark 14. And it says this on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, well, wait a minute. Mark said, what? On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, according to Leviticus 23, the Passover lamb is to be sacrificed on the sign, the 14th. The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the 15th day of the sign. Which comes first, 14 or 15? Don't give me that look, Sabrina. Oh, I don't know, <laughs> Dale. Which one comes first? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah 14 all this does is shows us how uh, uh, i used to work in flake but that sort of has negative connotations how that they just viewed these two feasts as one okay and you know we're in the midst of what we call what the holidays now you know and it's the same type of idea and so uh, a couple of disciples come to jesus and they say wait uh, where do you want us to go to prepare uh, to eat the Passover. So what did Jesus tell them to do? Go into a city. Go into the city and look for what? A man. A man yeah. A man, a man carrying a pitcher of water and do what? Follow him. Follow him. And then do what? <clears throat> you go to the guest room. It ends up being a large upper room furnished yeah. with. He says, wherever that guy goes into, say to the owner of that house. So he, he wasn't saying that that guy was the owner of the house. He's just saying, go into the city and you're going to see a guy carrying water. And you think, well, how would they know who, who the guy was carrying water? You know how they know? Men don't carry water. Who carries Ooh. water? Women. Women. Yeah. And, but apparently this man would be carrying water. Had somebody, it was Jim Ryan a while ago in the class said that, um, that he had read somewhere that the Essenes would carry their own waters. This guy might've been an Essene. Well, that sounds interesting. Oh, by the way, I just thought of something with the Job class, the online Job class. I think we're just going to do one session. Okay. We're going to try to do just one session. I've got too many com people complaining that they're missing our New Zealand friends. <laughs> and they, they just can't study the word of God without the New Zealand friends there. And so I, and I agree totally, you know, tell them to get online at seven o'clock. <laughs> I'll tell you what, two or three of them that really miss y'all the greatest will actually do the online thing. And they will come tomorrow because <laughs> they have found out that you can go to five 30, seven o'clock, nine in the morning and five 30 tomorrow night and study the same lesson is totally different. Oh, wow. Because, I mean, it, it, it's different people. It's different emphasis. Yeah. People want to, it's just, it's the wonder, the glory, of the word of God. The foundations, obviously, is the same. But all of a sudden, you're seeing things you never saw before, and you didn't see it last night. Yeah. You know? And so, uh, anyway, and so Jesus tells them exactly what to do. And he says, hey, go in and ask this guy. The master, the teacher, needs the guest room. They eat the Passover. I love what uh, is it Matthew, yeah, Matthew says, tell this guy that the teacher says, my time is near. Mm -hmm. Well, that's got a couple of interesting nuances to it. Doesn't it? The tell this secret code word. Code oh, phrase. I, oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah. The time is near, which means that Jesus knew that this dude, maybe they had talked about it. Maybe the Lord had prearranged it. Maybe, maybe the Lord knew that this guy was wondering when the time was going to be that the Lord had already spoke to him, that his place was going to be used for such. I'm wondering in the back of my mind, I'm thinking that this may be the same upper room that you see in Acts 2. Ooh. Yeah. Mm. And so anyway, um, I, I'm not sure why I'm thinking that, but it's a great thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's one of these things that doesn't really matter, but boy, if it, you know, when you start seeing things. So he says, you know, go do this in this way. And the disciples go and they do it. And I love it. And, and they found it exactly the way that Jesus said it would be. <laughs> wow, that's great. So they go and do what? They prepare the Passover. What are they doing when they're preparing the Passover, by the way? They're killing the lamb and putting the blood on the doorpost, aren't they? No. 
and making the unleavened bread. No, yeah, yeah, they're doing that. They're making unleavened bread. They're getting bread. Mm-hmm. They're cleaning out the room. They had to get what? Had to get all the yeah. leaven out. Had to do all this stuff. The cleaning. Had to get all the accessory stuff, the bitter herbs, all that kind of stuff. You know, together. Is this the fourteenth day? Uh, what day is this? Because is it on the fourteenth day? Don't they kill the lamb at twilight? They kill the lamb at twilight at four in the afternoon. I mean, at three in the afternoon. Sorry, I was on Eastern time for a moment. At three in the afternoon. Okay, so what time was this right here? Because the oh, very, twelve. Very next verse, and uh, well, the seventeenth verse of what I'm looking at it says, "When evening, when it was evening, he came with the twelve. Okay, so the lamb's already been. been no, no, the killed. lamb hasn't been killed yet. Oh, but it's in verse twelve. It says, "The first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed." Yeah. Yes, but it hadn't been sacrificed yet. It, he's just giving you the time frame that it's on Passover when the lamb is sacrificed, but it's not that day yet. Oh, it says was being first day of unleavened bread, which is the fourteenth. Yes, no, the first day of unleavened bread is actually the fifteenth. Yeah, that's and the Passover lamb is actually sacrificed on the fourteenth. Yes. So that's what I was talking about a while ago about how they viewed uh, these things as being uh, synonymous. In other words, they viewed uh, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread as being on the 14th when the Passover lamb was killed, though Leviticus 23 actually says it started on the uh, 15th. Here's what you got to keep in mind, two or three things. The day began when in the Hebrew calendar? When the sun mm-hmm. set. Mm-hmm. Okay. Three o'clock the when, evening. When the evening, when the sun sets. This time of year, the sun sets at six. We'll just use broad numbers here. Sun sets at six. The 14th was the day when they killed the Passover lamb between the evening, three o'clock in the afternoon. It was also called by the New Testament time the day of preparation. Why? Because they were preparing. They were getting things ready. But what's interesting, it's not that day yet. And they haven't killed the lamb for this reason. Don't forget this. I I, I ran across two or three commentaries I was reading this week, which they totally ignore this. The New Testament tells us that Jesus is our Passover lamb. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the Passover lamb. He's going to be killed at the same time the Passover lamb is going to be killed. He's not going to be killed the day before. He's not going to be killed the day after. He is fulfilling that typological prophecy of all that these feasts are all about. And so I believe it's the kind of thing that is the day before and all that stuff I showed you a while ago. If you look at it, you'll see all that fleshed out within the scripture. And so it's before the sun goes down the day before on the 13th, they're asking, Hey, where do you want us to go to get this thing prepared? Cause it takes you a little time to prepare. If you cook a big Christmas meal, the big Thanksgiving meal, do you wait till the morning of to get it going? Usually not. You've at least procured the food. Well, yeah. Okay. You've got the food there. Okay. Uh, And so that's what you're talking about. They had to go in and get everything ready. They had to get the room cleaned out. They had to get the stuff ready. They had to get all the things together. So when Jesus sits down and eats with them that evening, it is not the Passover meal proper. If for no other reason, he's the Passover lamb. And then in all the gospels, you see all these other things, which are more than major hints. Remember, the Jewish people wanted to get, I mean, the leadership wanted to get this done. They wanted to get him off that cross because the next day was a Sabbath day, a high holy Sabbath day, one of the uh, gospels says. Not just a weekly Sabbath. The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the 15th, was a high holy day. The last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a high holy day, a Sabbath day. And so they wanted to get him off the cross for that. And remember the, the uh, uh, religious rulers that were accusing him when they bring him before uh, all the pilot and all that. They didn't want to go in the pilot's place because they didn't want to make themselves unclean to where they could celebrate the Passover. And that was the so, same. Evening. Yeah. So this verse 17, you're saying this is um, the 12th day going into the 13th. No, verse 17. Let me jump down into that. When it says that it becomes evening right there. Mm-hmm. that day when they when it was evening it becomes the 14th mm-hmm. remember the first part of the days in the evening is the 14th jesus winds up having this meal with his disciples he goes out he gets arrested all the stuff with all the trials 
and they wind up crucifying the same day. This evening, he's having a meal with him at six o'clock. You go through the whole night thing. All that stuff happens to him at night. And then he's arrested. They haul him before all the trials. He's crucified at nine o'clock and he dies at three o'clock that same day. Oh, I'm getting the days mixed up because yes. this is the night before he is crucified. Yes. The 14th goes from twilight when they have this dinner all the way to um, the next you know, day. The next, the next day, and 3 p.m. when he dies is in that day. Yeah. Okay. And when he I, dies, I that's the same time that they're killing the lambs for yeah. the uh, uh, for the Passover. They kill the lamb. They start grilling the lamb, right? They had to grill it, had to cook it by fire. And then they would sit down to eat that meal. When they sat down to eat, to eat that meal, it was supper time. It became the 15th day. So the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is when they're eating the Passover meal that was prepared the day before. I know it's clear as mud <laughs> sometimes, but those little charts that I scrolled through a while ago, they're phenomenal because there's actually one that shows you here's the Roman time, here's the Hebrew time, here's the day, okay, that we think all this occurred, and you see the scripture sort of lined up with it. Uh, but the whole point of this is this, that Jesus wasn't having a Passover meal with them proper, Passover meal proper. I've done Seder, okay, and all that stuff you do with the first cup, the second cup, third cup, fourth cup, all the Jewish tradition, all this, and everybody says, this all speaks to Jesus. Well, yes, maybe, perhaps, but that's not what's going on here. And we lose sight of the great primary thing that's going on with this whole thing, which is that Jesus, when he sits there and says, hey, I've been wanting to celebrate this Passover with y'all. It wasn't because of the Passover. He said over in John, John 18 says a lot about all this stuff, by the way. Okay. What he was saying is this. I have been living for this time to make this new covenant with you. It's not about the Passover meal. It's about the new covenant that he's establishing right here. Mm -hmm. And that's an entirely different thing. Okay, entirely. So now I've got everybody confused, I can tell. So Are it's you... because of the um when the Jewish day starts. That's what's the confusing bit. Yeah, it is. You have to keep that in mind that it starts yeah. at sundown. And uh and then also I have to keep in mind two things. Uh what I have been taught and what I thought mm -hmm. I'd been taught. <laughs> so much of what we think we have taught I haven't really been taught I just made assumptions about so much that passes for teachings are just assumptions too and so anyway here we are we're on the evening of the 14th the sun's just gone down Jesus is having a meal with them the meal here by the way just consists they mentioned bread they mentioned wine there's no mention of the lamb there's no mention of the bitter herbs there's no mention of any of that mm -hmm. well that's just an argument from silence but it is a, a correct observation so there's no mission from this and he looks at him he says hey somebody truly one of you is going to betray me the one who's eating with me now and what was the response of of the people that heard that who is it which one of them what just anybody mm -hmm. <laughs> when jesus says somebody's going to bet betray me the disciples responded how not surely not yeah yeah they were grieved uh, and when you look at all the gospels, you find out Mark, they were grieved and they start saying, Hey, surely not. I surely not. I, you know, and they were going, well, who could it be? You know, what's going on? And in verse 20, Jesus says something really interesting. What does he say in verse 20? The one who dips with me in the bowl. Yeah. Yeah. But right before that, even though first part of the phrase, he says, what? One, one, of, the one of the 12. One of the 12. Oh, yeah. yeah. You notice right here, it says it is that it is, it's just there in the English language to help us. What that that gives us a hint about something here, folks. What does it give us a hint about? One of the twelve. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, well, one of them who's been with him from the very beginning. Okay, okay. Is actually going to be the one to betray him. But in from what we think we know and what we've always been taught about this gathering right here. <clears throat> Why would Jesus say one of the 12? Because most of the time we assume that how many people are in the room? Oh, we just assume. So, yeah. There must be more in the room. Yeah. 
more than likely there were other people in the room. There were other women probably in the room. I know this goes against the gospel of Da Vinci, but uh, <laughs> seriously, I mean, more, more people get their understanding of things from, from great songs and great art, you know, uh, more than likely there were other ladies or there other might've been even other men in here and they're all responding. Who, who's going to betray? Who's going to betray? And Jesus says, it's going to be one of the 12. And then he focuses in more, even more. He narrows it down to two. One who dips with me in the bow. It's one of these dudes on one of these sides right here. Now, I'm not going to argue with anybody over that, but I think there's a little hint right there that something's going on here. Why else would Jesus say one of the 12? If the only people in the room were the 12. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, but he didn't stop there. Jesus said in verse 21, for the son of man is to go just as it is, it is written of him. You notice how many times Jesus refers back. I guess in this chapter right here uh, in quotes, or uh, brings allusions to what was in the scripture as it was written of him. But woe to that man about whom the son of man is betrayed. It'd been good for him if he had never been born. So he narrows it down. He's letting them know, okay, it's a man who's going to betray me. Okay. Now we know from the other gospels that y'all you know, know, Peter, uh, Peter's got to know, right? So uh, John's sitting next to Jesus and Peter motions to him. Hey, Hey, ask him. And John leans over. Hey, master who is it and he says the one that i give <laughs> the sop to and he reaches over and he gets a uh, chip for some of the salsa right there and gives it to uh, judas and judas eats it what happens when judas eats it satan enters into him satan enters into him is that the first time that had happened See, I, I'm, I'm getting too obvious. Y'all, 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 y'all smell a rat in the trick question way too far. Actually, in one of the other gospels, when uh, uh, Judas went to cut the deal initially with the religious rulers, it says that Satan entered him then. So Satan mm -hmm. entered into him. Then apparently Satan did what? Left. Now he comes back and Jesus gives a sop to him and Satan enters into him. Then Jesus looks at him and says, go do quickly what you must do. Who's Jesus speaking to? Judas. Is it just Judas? Oh, well, Satan. Yeah. Yeah. He's speaking to Judas. He's speaking to Satan. And that's when the other gospels tell us this. Judas gets up. The disciples are just la-di-da-di-da-di-da-di-da. -da. They think he's going to go off and uh, give some money to the poor or buy supplies. Supplies for what? The Passover meal they think they're having tomorrow. Mm. Are, are you with me, Rachel? <laughs> yes. Yep. I'm with you. <laughs> She's thinking really hard. I can see different things. And uh, <clears throat> I tell you what, though, I mean, I, and I've heard this lately. Okay. I've heard people teach and preach that uh, Jesus offered salvation and offered the grace of the Lord to Judas by giving him that sop and that Judas received the grace of Jesus. No, uh, no, 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 no. J Jesus didn't institute the new covenant, the Lord's Supper, as we call it. He didn't do that until Judas was out of the room. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it's not rocket science, folks. If you just read it, right? Yeah. But I mean, you just wouldn't believe how many people would not just read. Well, y'all would believe it. Yeah. So what does Jesus do? They, while they're eating verse 22 he's eating he took some of the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to him and said what take this is my body you have an account of this in matthew mark luke and over first corinthians remember paul gave an account of this about how the lord had revealed this to him mm -hmm. what had happened this evening paul wasn't there but the lord had revealed it to him and generally when you when we do communion times together uh people quote first corinthians more than they do anything you know because mm -hmm. it's sort of succinct you know so, and then he took the cup and gave thanks and he gave it to them and, and, and they all drank from it. Apparently a common cup, right? And he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So I, I think sometimes we do get distracted by the whole uh, Passover and the timing and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> I think it's really important to know you know, why not be accurate? Why not be correct? You know, that kind of thing. 
but um, what's really going on here is even of greater importance that the Lord is establishing the new covenant and he's showing them what he is about to do that his death that he is the sacrificial lamb and when you look at all this it lines up with everything that's said in the old testament fulfilling all the prophecies so they get finished eating what do they do they sing a song depart. they sing a song they sing kumbaya or something what do they sing uh -huh. um, i thought that was actually quite interesting I why is that oh i don't know i just didn't it sounded like a little mini church service <laughs> Well, the, the creator of all is sitting right there with you, you know, which he is anyway with all of us right now. Uh, yeah, traditionally, they would have sung um, a psalm, uh, the Hallel, Psalm 113 through 118. They would have sung all if or part of that right there. It was something very traditional that they would have done at a gathering in a time like this. So, and, and I guarantee you, Jesus was the one that led out in this. I mean, you know, the disciples aren't going to sit there and jump. So they go out to the Mount of Olives. Why there? Well, isn't that where Jesus usually went to pray? Yeah, it was his hangout. That's absolutely right. Yeah, that's where he went. That's what he did. How do we know that? Because Judas knew where he liked to hang out. He knew where he liked to go. And so they come to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, hey, y'all sit here until I've prayed. You know, Matthew and Mark, uh, don't say anything about Jesus telling them to pray. Uh, Luke does says, pray that you may not enter into, into temptation. He tells them that. And he tells the disciples to wait over here and I'm going to go pray. Well, then he leaves, but he takes three of the disciples with him, Peter, James, and John, as he often did. So that leaves how many disciples back here in the first group? Oh, Eight. this is mess. Nine. Eight. I've got an eight and I got a nine. Eight. Eight. Well, eight or eight, less. Eight. Just Judas is gone. You got it. Eight. So Judas, I know I'm sorry you didn't know you had to do math tonight, you know. <laughs> Why not be accurate? Why not be correct? You got eight over here. Jesus takes these three. And it's these three that he really does the interaction with of could you not tarry with me one hour? You know, he's sort of speaking to those that are, are the leaders. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we took Peter, James, and John, and he he's very distressed and troubled. Had they had Peter, James, and John seen Jesus in an unusual situation already? Transfiguration. You reckon? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They'd seen him glorified. Now they're seeing him what? Distressed. Oh, here we go. They've seen him glorified. Now they're about to see him glorified. Mm. Uh, yeah, I just made that up. That's pretty, that's pretty corny, but 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 you know, y'all will not forget dramatic. it. You won't forget it. I'm going to eliminate it from my mind right now. <laughs> it, You'll, you'll dream it tonight. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that just popped into my mind. Throw it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just because it pops into my mind does not mean it has to come out of my mouth, right? <laughs> the earlier class missed out on that. <laughs> they did. They did. Oh, we my. Share. share the well. <laughs> but yet they are seeing him very distressed. They're seeing him very troubled. They've seen him in one extreme. Of course, Peter's response in that first extreme. Hey, let's build a tabernacle. The three of them had wisdom right here. When he comes back and uh, berates them and says things about, uh, we don't have an account of them saying a word. They're sleeping. Yeah, but when he wakes them up, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. couldn't you tell? Yeah. So they're distressed. And he says to them, hey, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. That keep watch thing literally means this. Stay alert and stay awake. Mm -hmm. How'd that go? Uh, pretty poorly. <laughs> yeah. And he goes away from them a little distance. He falls on the ground. He begins to pray. This is wild, folks. What did he pray? That the cup would be removed. That if possible, the hour might pass by him. And Mark describes that. Then he comes along and gives the, the, the Lord's words about that in verse 36. <laughs> Abba, Father. <laughs> Start with no fine Jewish boy would have used that Aramaic intimacy mm -hmm. in relationship to God, unless you do happen to be the son of God. It's that moment of uh, desperation, that moment of intensity, that moment of complete humanness right here. Mm -hmm. He declares this truth. 
all things are possible for you. So Rachel, for your physical condition, all things are possible. For the things that each one of us are thinking in our mind right now, that Lord, we need to move right here. We need something to happen. All things are possible. God himself declares this to God. Our Lord says to his Lord and our Lord, all things are possible. Remove this cup from me. But you know what? Yet not what I, my will is, but what your will is. This right here is just wow, because here Jesus mm -hmm. is, God in the form of flesh. He set aside some things according to Philippians, but he's God and he's in communion with God the Father. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. The unity of the oneness of God before the foundations of the earth determined what was going to happen right here before anything was spoken to existence. But then he's actually coming to the Father and saying, you know what, even with that, even though we've agreed to all this, all things are possible with you, Father. You could do something different. Just when I think I get my mind wrapped around that, my head explodes. Yeah. <laughs> Help me here, Sabrina. What, what, what do you think? I mean, what do you think, Rachel? I mean, it's just, I mean, an intensity of emotions, an intensity of awareness of the true nature of God. And he's calling out to him, but he says, you know, all that aside, your will is what I want. I always thought that that's the that first 36 is his human side. Yeah, I know what you mean by that, but even that fails because you, you can't pick and choose. Okay, here's the God moment. Here's the human moment because he's yeah. totally God and he's totally man. Fullness yeah. of both, you know, and yet it is the emotions of the humanity because guess he came to die, but to die required a body, yeah, a human body. So here he is in his human body and he's experiencing every element and he knows uh, it doesn't say in this gospel, but later on, I think it's in John, it says that Jesus aware of all that was about to happen really it's not the Which dying makes it worse though isn't it yeah like, oh it you're does. aware of what's going to happen to you <laughs> yeah but what what was the worst see none of us are fearful of dying what we're fearful of is whatever is going to be the process okay. thereof whatever yeah. that process is jesus wasn't fearful as much of the process as it was that he knew that moment of all the sins of mankind past present future will be laid upon him and he would cry out my god my god why have you Forsaken me. forsaken me yeah mm -hmm. see that's where he knew he was going at that point see we don't have to carry that burden he's carried that burden for us yeah but the force okay so yes he did cry out my god my god why have you forsaken me yes but that's the opening to psalm 22 yes so he's pointing to that psalm and so you have to read it in the full context of that psalm where yeah. at the end he says it's <laughs> finished yeah. You know, and, yeah. and he also says, you will never forsake me in that psalm. Yeah. So. yeah. So it's the cry of what? What you see David doing all the time in the psalm, starting off right here. You get the psalms in the 40, and he goes, why are you despair, my soul? Put yeah. your hope in God. You know, exactly. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing. It wasn't the fact that he didn't know, and it wasn't the fact that God had abandoned him or forsaken him. He was pointing people to where? He was pointing people to God. Right. You know that thing. Uh, serious stuff so anyway he came and he found them sleeping so jesus he stops praying he gets up comes and he finds them he's checking on them. and he says to simon peter could you not keep watch for one hour keep watch and praying that you may not come into temptation the spirit is willing the flesh is weak he's saying i know man i know he said you need to keep watch you need to keep alert and he's letting them know you need to be praying you need to be praying I think that verse is um, uh, particularly for right now. Yeah. For the, for the whole, the whole of the body. Yeah. Yeah. But because it's watch and pray, and the watching part, a lot of Christians believers aren't alert to things going on. No. Um, and a lot of prayer is just not people aren't praying. Yeah. They, they don't have this. It's praying is this constant communication to and from listening and speaking and 
you know, with, with God and yourselves, and I, that's not going on. It's John 15 thing. It's abiding in the Lord. Yeah. yeah. Live and continue. Mm-hmm. Uh, you wouldn't believe you can't get people to pray. Yeah. I mean, you can't. They're into perfunctory things. Okay. Now, there's a group of people I know. If I sit there and say, hey, we're going to gather at the house tonight. Y'all come and pray with us. They will. Okay. Yeah. And that's great. That's fine. But from the point of view with uh, particularly uh, uh, mainstream denominational thing, I mean, you, you can sit there and say, why don't we have a prayer gathering? Yeah. I've been trying to do it for years and years. and I can't get it done. I mean, uh, the, the previous leadership said this to me literally, well, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just a name. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm quite serious. Listen to this. What would you do? Let me tell you, you talk about a move of God to control my snarky tongue at that moment. Because y'all may find this surprising, but I can be a little snarky from time to time. <laughs> Only with people that I love who I know love me. Because, you know, and I said, well, uh, and but I have to keep in mind that I know that they have no idea. You may be in the leadership position. You may have this job, but they have no idea. Well, here's what I, I like to do that we will pray some and we'll sing. And a lot of times mm-hmm. when I'm singing, I'm sitting at the piano and I'm singing and praying. Mm-hmm. You want to hear the greatest compliment I've ever got in my life? Y'all ready for this? Here's the greatest compliment. This was about uh, 22 years ago. So I'm helping the local First Baptist Church out down here. And I'm just going to be there for a year. Just an interim thing. So I'm not pushing any envelopes. But they want me just to be myself. So I'm just sort of being myself a little bit. And so it was great. It was a great year. And that's still where we had the precept classes now. Still that same church. Great, wonderful people. A couple of years later, the pastor told me this. He said, did I ever tell you that I got in all sorts of trouble with you? And I had to sort of defend you. I said, what was I doing? He said, I had these people complaining. I said, what were they complaining about? And they said this, that they couldn't tell when you quit talking and when you started praying. (laughs) Was that because they didn't know when to bow their heads? They didn't know (laughs) when to assume the position (laughs) that I'd be. I would be singing a song and just speaking of things and just giving thanks to God and speaking of things and singing. And they didn't know when to assume the position or when to get holy or when to get godly or when. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> it's, it's like what our conversation should be all the time. And yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm guilty of it. Like in my mind, if something happens while I'm out and about and I think, well, praise God, that's awesome. I catch myself making the words not come out because of where I am. And that's, we should be allowed, be able to feel courageous and free just to yeah. allow that to come out. Yeah. And just to be who you are. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I just want to have a time where we're praying where we're singing. And you know what? I actually told this particular leadership, don't worry, you don't have to come. I'm thinking, as a matter of fact, I don't want you there you know but you don't have to i mean there's no burden with this you know just you know and there's no concept of that Mm -hmm. of just the the flowing of things uh we're getting more and more better more better (laughs) i'll use that more better uh they know now uh i had this happen recently uh if somebody says well y'all pray for me about this guess what when are we going to do it we stop right, right then and there. Right now. And in this case right here, somebody needs some serious healing. I mean, life-threatening healing. Mm-hmm. And they know now that I carry a little anointing oil thing around in my pocket all the time. I don't know how many pairs of blue jeans I have baptized for that anointing oil. <laughs> Leave spots all over everything. And uh, so we actually did in this gathering, we're praying for this person. And I knew I was about to pray for him. And two or three other people were. And then one person just prayed and just went, amen, and cut it off. And why is that? In this case, I think it was unintentional. In this case, I think it's just nervousness and just didn't know. Hey, let's leave a little room right here for God to do something. 
Mm-hmm. You know, let's leave a little time. I do that right now uh, with our worship. We'll usually sing maybe three songs on Sunday morning in the contemporary service. They used to do like five or six. I said, no, 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 no. We're going to do three, and we're going to leave time for the spirit to breathe. Instead of pow, 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 pow. Hey, God, are you pleased with us? Aren't you excited about what we just did? Yeah. And there's no concept of that, of just seeing what it says biblically about this, of what it means to keep watch, what it means to pray, what it means to struggle, what it means to sit there as a body and be quiet for 10 minutes. Nobody say anything. In the Western world, we just freak out over that, you know, and uh, corporately that starts uh, in really small gatherings in the home, you know that kind of thing, that, that kind of freedom. So here, Jesus, he's acknowledging that. He's, man, I know your spirit is willing, but I know the flesh is weak. I know you're tired. <laughs> you know, he knew it was about to happen. They couldn't believe what was about to happen. So he goes away. He prays again, comes back in verse 40. He found him doing what? Sleeping. Sleeping. The eyes are very hairy, are very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. So apparently he woke him up again. He, they just didn't know what to say. Uh, which is amazing because he remember before Peter didn't know what to say. That's when he said, Hey, let's build the tabernacle to you. You know, he said that because they didn't know what to say. So he says, you still sleeping and resting? Tell you what, it's enough. What does he mean by it is enough? Verse 41 right there. Done. It's done. Time's arrived. If you're not quite sure what that phrase is, read the rest of it. It tells you. The hours come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed. The one that's going to do it is coming right now. Y'all get up. Let's be going. Behold, it's now it's going. And I, man, I can't even begin to imagine what their emotions were and their confusion and what's going on in the midst of all this. So what do you think the next word is that Mark's going to say? Immediately. You got it. So Jesus is actually still saying this. He's telling them, come on, guys, let's wrestle up. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. So he gets the three going. He gets the other eight. <clears throat> and me that while this has happened, Judas, which Judas, don't you love how Mark says these little things? One of the 12. Yeah, one of the 12, just in case you get confused. Accompanied by what? A crowd. A crowd of what? With swords and clubs. Yeah, a crowd of people with swords and clubs. And where were they from? Oh, they were from the chief priest. I always thought it was the chief, the priest, but it's not, is it? They've sent somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, far, they're far too high and almighty for this kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 So we know it's a crowd right here. Did the other gospels tell you anything? Of course they do, or I wouldn't ask. So they're from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. That's all the Jewish leadership. Okay. John helps tremendously. Can I read John to you? This is out of John 18. I want to start with verse four. So Jesus, knowing all things that were coming upon him, there's that verse, went forth and said to them, whom do you seek? So you have all these people. Well, let me back up verse three. I skipped the most important one. Verse three. Judas then, having received the Roman cohort and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. It was a Roman cohort. Mm. Yeah, maybe some people think 600 soldiers. It's this this thing of the, remember when the, uh, Jewish leadership couldn't trip Jesus up after about the second or third time they went and started planning with the Herodians. They started dealing, planning with the political party. And so now they're working hand in glove with the Roman government to come in the darkness in this grove to arrest Jesus where nobody can see him with lanterns and torches. There's 600 soldiers right here. We know from what we saw in Mark that uh, uh, Judas had, told him what to do with the signal. It's going to be the guy that I give a kiss to. That's the one you arrest. And in verse 44 of Mark, Judas is feeling his oats here. He says, uh, he's the one that you're supposed to see. Uh, seize him, tie him up, and put him under guard. Like he's in charge of this thing. I mean, Judas was just getting all arrogant with this thing. John tells us that Jesus knew what was going on. John does not give an account of Judas giving the kiss. So what must have happened is Judas gives the kiss, and then Jesus says, in John, whom do you seek? And they answered him, Jesus Nazarene, verse 5 of the 18th chapter of John, Jesus says this, I am he, but it's just I am. Listen to this. Judas was with him, the one that was betraying. So when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. 
John 18, 6. We've talked about this before, I think, at times past. But this is wild. When Jesus says, I am, all this crowd with their swords and their clubs and their lantern all fell back to the ground. There's all sorts of interpretations of this. Some people say, well, they, they realized who he was, so they all stepped back and they bowed down before him. Really now? No, it's the power of the word that I he think, spoke. I think it's the power that when he said, I am, ego me, the mm -hmm. same Greek term that was used by God when Moses said, who shall I say ascended me? I, I am. am. That the power of God slammed these soldiers to the ground. And then in verse 7, <laughs> It says, therefore, he asked them again, whom do you seek? Why did he ask them again? They're all on the ground. <laughs> well, they had to get up off the ground and they got off no. the ground. Uh, oh, by the way, who did you say that you were seeking? They're not they, doing what they're supposed <laughs> to be doing. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and they said, Jesus Nazarene, he says, I told you that I am. So that if you seek me, let these go their way. Let my guys go. These guys had got slammed to the ground. People say, well, how did they get away? Uh, this guy says, I am. We get slammed to the ground. We come back and he says, hey, who are you looking for? Uh, Jesus, and that's, okay, that's me. But why don't you let these guys go? Uh, okay, we'll let these guys go. And they, they, they flee. Why this happened? According to John, to fulfill the word which he spoke. Of those whom you've given me, I have not lost a one. I just find that to be one of the more intriguing passages in scripture right there that the power of God slammed those things down. I know there's other attempts at interpretation of that. Uh, I find them all less than satisfying. I think the God just knocked them down. Judas comes up. He does all this. They arrest him. Uh, one of the disciples, the disciples actually start crying out, hey, do you, do you want us to fight? You want us to do something? Lord, shall we strike with a sword? That's what it says in Luke. Well, one of us had already started swinging a sword. I wonder who that could be. Uh -huh. mark doesn't say who it is but john no. does john does says yeah. hey it's peter you know so peter uh he he wasn't going for the ear folks he was going for the neck he's going to slice this guy's head off and it was a slave of the high priest he cuts off his ear jesus is saying hey hey why are you doing this why why did you come out like this why did you do this kind of stuff come at me like i'm a robber or something i'm with you every day in the temple you could have arrested me anytime why did you seize this why is it well, they didn't want to be seen in the daylight by the, the masses of the people because Jerusalem was overrun. It's a high festival. Okay. They were doing this in the darkness, but Jesus just says this, okay, has to take place to fulfill the scripture. Don't you love, is it John? That, yeah. John's the one that comes along and says, oh yeah, he healed this slave's mm -hmm. ear. If he cut the ear mm -hmm. off, he reached down, picked it up, put it back on. If he cut it, you know, it's hanging. Jesus reaches up, touches it and heals it. And then it says that the servant's name is Malchus. John tells us that. I wonder why he tells us the name. I mean, we're not told why. I think we'll probably see him in glory in eternity. You know, I think if somebody sliced my ear off and this might put it back on and healed it, you're likely to believe that he's Messiah. You know? And so then you have verse 50 of Mark. 14 they all left him and fled jesus had said they would do that he provided them the way out right here gave them a moment with the roman cohort and everything let my guys go they take off <laughs> you know if i'm one of these guys if i'm one of the disciples i'm going hey jesus did say that we would flee and he just opened the door for us right there i guess we should do what take off get out of there yeah then verse 51 talk about a weird verse yeah Oh, yeah. A young man was following him, following Jesus, wearing nothing but a linen sheet. And notice of nothing but is in English to sort of help the situation. Just read it without those extra words. Wearing a linen sheet over naked, and they seized him. So the guy's got a linen sheet on. People get freaked out over that because they think everybody should dress as we do in the Western world. Verse 52, but he pulled free the linen sheet and escaped naked. That's, we had this little two verse vignette right here. What is this all about? Kind of speaks to how desperate he was to get away. Okay. How desperate it was. Why didn't he run off with the disciples to start with? Well, he wasn't one of the 12. Right. He's just people that were hanging around and he was a young man. 
uh, probably younger than even John. John, by this time, was probably about 21, something like that. Uh, we think that this is actually John, him, I mean, Mark himself, John Mark, who's writing this book. We think it's him uh, putting in a little self-deprecating thing. What's this thing with linen sheet? Probably his pajamas. More than likely, he's just asleep and he hears all the ruckus going through the city with all this cohort and everything. He follows everybody and then he sees Jesus right there. And Jesus is hanging out and his disciples flee. So he's just hanging out with Jesus and he's following along behind Jesus. And they want to arrest and grab somebody. So who do they grab? <clears throat> They're going to grab everybody that's there that's not them. <clears throat> as far as soldiers. They grab his pajamas. He runs right at him. First streaker. <laughs> yeah i have fun with young people about that hey you know streaking's in the bible right what <laughs> yeah right there yeah 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 <clears throat> yeah and he runs free and he escapes and he gets out of there uh it also gives just such authenticity to the uh uh the eyewitness element of the narrative right here you know these that this is a real thing that's going down. So they lead Jesus away. In the first place, they take him to where? Verse 53, the high priest. And the chief priests and the elders and the scribes are all there. So they sent the soldiers and all the officers of the high priest. They bring him in. And the whole council, what were they trying to do? And it's all, this. these are the sharpest, wisest people of Judaism. And what are they trying to do? Trying to find something to charge him with. How'd that go? Not, they're not succeeding because everybody's contradicting themselves. Yeah, you got a lot of people coming in and giving false testimony, but these are the these are the top leadership. And so they're they're smart. They know how this goes. And even today, if you wind up arresting two or three people for a particular thing, what are they going to do? They're going to separate you immediately and then they're going to uh, question you and interrogate you and find out every detail. And if there's any inconsistency within this, they will know what is lying, what is truth. And that's the whole point. And they did that. <laughs> so they they got all these people testifying but they realized that they uh, and this mission here twice okay that they weren't finding uh it was false testimony and the testimony wasn't what was the word of uh, consistent, consistent right yeah the testimony wasn't consistent and they knew it and they said we can't bring these people up here because the testimony is not gonna, and this goes on and on and they're getting sort of frustrated and then finally i had a couple people saying hey we heard him say that he's going to destroy the temple uh, made with hands and in three days he will build it without hands the Jewish leadership were going, well, yeah, but even that wasn't consistent in the testimony. And what's the point of that? You're going, you know, okay, we don't want anybody destroying the building, but we can't execute the guy for this. So finally, the high priest had had enough of it. What is he doing? This is a big dude right here, the top guy. He stands up and does what? Question Jesus directly. Yeah, he comes forward and says, hey, I've had enough of this. Why aren't you answering these guys? Why, why, why aren't you responding to how these guys are testifying against you? And what was Jesus' response to that question? Nothing. Something, something that we probably have the hardest time with. Maybe I'm just the only one. Mm -hmm. It's hard sometimes to be silent when you're falsely accused. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the pattern that Jesus shows right here is that you're silent until the time. There's going to be a time when you'll speak. There'll be a time he'll release, whatever. So, he, he didn't say anything because the high priest is beating around the bush right here. So the high priest just cuts to it. He says, hey, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Well, there you go. By the high priest saying this, representative of the nation of Israel right here, are you the blessed? Are you the Messiah, the Christ, the Christ is the Messiah, the son of the blessed? That is the bottom line. Jesus will answer that one. In Matthew, he's, Matthew's account says that Jesus says, hey, you said it. Mark says, I am. But Jesus doesn't stop there. What does he say next? He quotes scripture. Yeah, he, he quotes the uh, 110th Psalm, I think. He <laughs> says, I am. And you know what? You shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. <laughs> He'd been calling himself that son of man thing all the way through. And they knew what he meant by that out of Daniel. Okay. Now he's doubling, tripling, quadrupling down. He is now calling himself. Are you ready for this one? The cloud rider. The cloud rider. 
the Jews had this understanding that the one that's coming in the clouds, the one who's going to be, and they called it cloud rider, that would be riding the clouds would be the Messiah. And Jesus is saying what? I'm, I'm, the, cloud, he. I'm the cloud rider. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the Messiah out of Psalm 2, Psalm yep. 110, Daniel. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All, I mean, all of them, all, how, whatever, 300 something of them. And and he'd already told his disciples, hey, y'all don't fear of this. Don't fret of this because I'm going to die, but then I'll be raised again from the dead. These priests weren't aware of that. That's the reason that when all this went down and the priests, when they were sacrificing the lamb, by the way, for the nation of Israel, three o'clock later the day, it was at that moment when the veil was torn from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. It's when they were sacrificing the lamb. High priest had what he wanted, had what he needed. And what was his response? Uh, it's blasphemy blasphemy so what did he do he tore his clothes right mm -hmm. a lot of clothes tearing going on right here he had the clothes torn off the young man right there you had the clothes torn off that high priest okay and, and grieving because of blasphemy later on you're gonna have the temple veil torn from top to bottom showing there's no longer separation uh access to god the ultimate tearing was it in hebrews that talked about the lord's flesh being torn the veil of his flesh being torn on our behalf so he says what further need do we have the witnesses and they all agree there's blasphemy and they condemned him to death you know it's really the moment in john you know john one where he came to his own and his own rejected him uh -huh. it's the moment where yes i am mm -hmm. and they say i don't care <clears throat> yeah yeah and you know what there are many 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 of them here that knew and and it's great because later on we're told that not a small number of the priests believed, which means a lot of them believe that Jesus was uh, the key leaders right here. Uh, some of them did believe. I mean, we have accounts of two of, you know, uh, uh, Nicodemus and uh, what's the other one? Uh, uh, Joseph. Come, Joseph. Yeah. That comes gets his body. Uh, I think there were probably a lot more, uh, but there were a lot of them that didn't. So what was their response then? Verse 65, they start beating him. They spit on him. They blindfold him. They get nasty with him. Prophesy, you know, who's this hitting you? They're slapping him around. And, you know, I think they're sort of ecstatic right here. Uh, little did they know what Jesus was going to say a few hours later on the cross. You know, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So uh, at this time, and, and, Mark had done this little sandwich thing back in verse 54. We sort of skipped over it. Peter had come in with Jesus. He was in the courtyard. How did Peter get in? John tells us. Because John knew the high priest. And John knew some of the people there. So John comes in, gets into that courtyard, goes up there, talks to a couple of folks, goes back with a guard and gets Peter to come in. John got Peter into that courtyard. And so Peter's there and he's warming himself by the fire. Why is that? it was cold it's cold thank you yeah 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 it's cold <laughs> and so he's there and one of the servant girls sees him and says what hey weren't you with jesus and peter makes a mistake what was his mistake when that servant girl said hey you were with jesus the nazarene that, that what was his mistake right here he denied it yeah his mistake was he opened his mouth mm -hmm. None of us have ever made that mistake before. <laughs> you know, because what happened? Yes, he denied it. Jesus had already told him, you're going to deny me three times. That's the biggest, biggest mistake. But the second he said a couple of words, they heard his accent. Uh, mm -hmm. Us here in the States, he was a Yankee. He no. Was, he was he, up north. They're in the north and he's a southerner. <laughs> No, no, because he's from Galilee. It's in the north. Uh, and they were in Judea and Jerusalem. Judea is the south, because we all know the south is God's country. God does not reside in the north. Oh. You have to be from the States and enjoy all the entertainment here, guys. Sorry. Well, they do call New Zealand God's zone, and we're the southest of the south. Uh, well, that is the truth, or the outer of the outer. I don't know which it is. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, when he spoke, they heard his accent, which really sort of drives the story right here. And he denied, he denied it. I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And he's talking down to this little girl. She's a slave girl. But he relocates. He goes out to the porch. 
servant girl sees him again, but this time she's talking to the people around her saying, Hey, this guy's one of them. I know I saw him with him. You know, she's thinking like this. And again, he denied it. But after the while, the bystanders now, not the little girl say what? Surely one of you, you're one of them for you are a Galilean too. How they know he's a Galilean. That, that nasty Yankee accent. And those of y'all from the North, spies. y'all forgive me. I'm just having fun. I don't think he had Galilean clothes, did he? Maybe. I don't know. Fine. But how did he respond that time? He swore. Yeah, he cursed and swore. I mean, what's the difference between a curse and a swearing? Yeah. You're, you're cursing yourself and you're cursing the others, I guess. And he swore that he did not know this man. Hey, what's the next word you think, according to Mark? Immediately. Immediately. You know, Mark's the only gospel that tells us that the rooster crowed the second time. All the other ones tell us, hey, the rooster crowed, but this is the second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, behold, or before a rooster crows, twice you'll deny me three times. And he began to weep. I put a song up on the uh, Bible study Facebook group uh, three or four mm -hmm. hours ago. And it's just you asking earlier, Rachel, what song, you know? And this song always comes to mind of this. It's out of a musical at the first church I was at. We did this like 40 years ago. And um, as a matter of fact, 41 years ago right now. And um, my college roommate sang the solo. It's just called Peter's Song. But it's the most powerful song describing what happened to Peter in this account right here. And to this day, it still hoes well. And so uh, and then I was thinking of my old college roommate. So I put another song up there he sang a song that wound up being number one in the nation and y'all will probably recognize the song uh when you see it and um but anyway uh peter realized that that which the lord said would occur had occur and he went outside and wept bitterly but the lord had already told him but when you're restored i want you to lead these guys okay. Sometimes we forget that word of restoration in the midst of the devastation, <laughs> the devastation of the Lord being right. You know, the devastation of us just walking right into it rather than avoiding, you know, so, it's yeah. swept along, being swept along by fear. Oh, gosh. Just that intense fear. Yeah. I don't know that any of us would have done much better. No, no, I wouldn't oh. even have been there. I mean, it's quite courageous for him to actually be there. Yeah, yeah. For John and Peter both. Yeah, John's yeah. at the foot of the cross, you know? Mm. And Yeah, uh, I was thinking about that during the night, and I was thinking, I don't think I could actually stand there like, you know, all the women were standing around at the base of the cross, and I, I don't think I could even be there. Yeah. Uh, the women, particularly in that society, they were just ignored. You know, which there's certain advantages to that. <laughs> you know, they, they, they weren't going to give him a second look about that. John standing there, Jesus mm -hmm. looking down, uh, woman, your son, son, your mom right here. That's phew. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we do not, you, you don't point the finger at what was going on with these guys right here. Mm -hmm. you know? What you do point the finger at is uh, the grace and the mercy of God. And what is occurring and what's happening right here to the Lord and what he did for us. So uh, anyway, well, we'll stop right there. We'll pick it up next week. Uh, anything else y'all like to share? So is next week, 15 and 16. Next week is 15 and 16. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we will. And then uh, you will therefore be declared experts in Mark. <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm aware. I'm, I'm, I'm just totally amazed. And how expertly ignorant I was about Mark. Yeah, I, I, me too. I, I've learned so much from this, <laughs> you know, and, and it's, it's not particularly any one thing. There's a lot of little things I can point to, but just bigger picture. I think it's, I mean, all the gospels are useful. I mean, words fail me. This gospel is far more useful than it has been uh, expressed in my life and taught in my life and preached in my life. I, I, I think it's a word for today. I really do. So, so uh, well, let's pray together. Rachel, will you pray for us? Pray for yourself also. It's good to do that, folks. Okay. 
Father, we just thank you so much for your word, for what you um, instructed Mark to write down for us. Yes. And how it's affected our mindset and our life. And I just really pray that you help us to be watchful of our circumstances, of the world, of events, of just everything, that you'll help us to discern what is good and what is not, what is truth and what is not, and help us to be prayerful as well, um, and to always have this ongoing abiding conversation with you constantly, Lord. We just really pray that, um, that the church will be watchful and prayerful, and we just pray for... Um, healing of myself and others who are not 100% um, and those who are going to watch this afterwards um, like Randall we just yes, pray Lord. for healing on him as well Yes, Lord. and uh, in your name amen 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 thank you all so much love you dearly I'm, I'm just amazed I'm sitting here Rachel listening to you and you're in the middle of my head I mean just as clear probably more clear than if you were here right now and you're some 12,000 miles away. I was just a wonder and glory. Into the next day. Into the next day. You, you are, that's even a better way to think. You are 17 hours into the future. Mm -hmm. And um, the future that we will experience 17 hours from now. And, um, and yet the Lord has brought us together for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. It's not by happenstance. And it's uh, for us, it's for now, but not limited to that to now. And so I speak of y'all constantly to, to impart faith here where, where I live within this circle of Oikos and this influence and of, of encouraging people to pray, encouraging people to be in the word of God, encouraging people to meet new people and to realize that the Lord is knitting us together again mm -hmm. for such a time as this. So thank y'all mm -hmm. so much. So, so much. See you next week. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.